I think we should start in the interest of keeping on time. We've got a big, uh, big grand rounds today. Looking forward to hearing from some of our residents. And so I'd like to turn it over to our vice chair for medical education, Dr. Sundrain Van Shake, to get us started. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds, uh, a special Grand Rounds uh, today that features a lot of our residents who under um, leadership of Dr. John Takayama are gonna present their QI work. Um, John Takayama, I think is known to, well, very, very well known to the pediatric community at UCSF is professor of clinical pediatrics. He provides primary care for children with medical complexity and developmental disabilities at UCSF Mount Zion. He's also the site director for the resident continuity clinic and is one of 15 DEI catalysts in our department. He's position support for H ASHEW, an AAP practice collaborative that, to improve screening for social determinants of health, and is helping to revise the chapter on quality improvement for the Academic Pediatric Association Continuity Clinic Director's Manual. And I think you all know him as someone who's incredibly dedicated to resident education and um, is, has spearheaded this um, annual uh, seminar uh, for, for many, many years. John. Sandrine, thank you so much for the uh, introduction. And so today's talk once again is on quality improvement or QI projects in resident continuity clinics. And these will be presented by resident representatives at uh, Mount Zion and also at China Basin. Uh, and just as you know, you already know, this is under extraordinary circumstances, un unfortunately, uh, but uh, just really delighted uh, to lead this off. Uh, next, please. So I wanted to first start uh, with land acknowledgement. Um, and so bear with me. Um, so California has the largest Native American population in the country and land recognition uh, is important because they recognize the past and present of Native American cultures and invite us all of us to think about the ways in which we benefit from settler colonialism and remind us that colonization happened and is still happening. And also to counter the doctrine of discovery with the true story of the people who are already here. They create public Public awareness of the history and ongoing presence of indigenous people. So this particular land acknowledgement um, is adapted uh, from the land acknowledgement statement of the UCSF Department of Surgery, which in turn was created in partnership with the UCSF Native American Health Alliance, the Association of Native American Medical Students, and uh, Rami Edush uh, Ohlone um, elders. So I'm gonna read from the slide. So today we would like to acknowledge the uh, Rami De Tush alone, alone people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the uh, Rami Edush alone elders, past, present, and future who call this place, the land that UCSF sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue the tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Rami Edush alone community for their stewardship and support. And we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so just, you know, so we do need to um, make sure that we do disclosures and I happen to have uh, some um, stock in certain companies and so here it is, but there are no conflicts of interest with this particular grand rounds. Next, please. So the objectives of today's QI Grand Rounds are as follows. To describe resident QI projects to improve screening practices, and there are two that we'll talk about. One is anemia, the other is food insecurity. To examine how residents improve their self-care during pandemic. To discuss resident participation in a practice-wide QI project to improve immunization rates. And finally, to understand how to involve families in selecting QI projects. Next, please. So what is quality improvement? And um, I'm just gonna have one slide about this. So it's continuous, uh, it includes measurable improvements. Uh, and probably the most important is sort of further down this quote, which is to achieve equity and improve the health of the community. 
And the reason why I have this um, slide up uh, on the right hand side is you see the little ripples. And so the key thing is the ripples and the little. So a lot of the changes that we can make, you know, may seem a little bit little, uh, but they add up. Uh, and if you have many of them, that can really move things along. And so just a reminder uh, with the photograph. Next, please. So resident continuity clinic at Mount Zion and China Basin. Uh, so we have many residents who do clinic uh, maybe uh, once a week, maybe three weeks uh, a month, uh, but uh, they all tend to come to clinic on certain days and have certain faculty members uh, who are a faculty for the pod. Uh, so the pod basically can be up to eight residents uh, per pod. Uh, unfortunately, we'll see in the next slide, uh, the pods could not be together in the same way during the pandemic. But this is kind of how the continuity clinics are set up. Next, please. Okay, so just, um, it's been a difficult year. Uh, and it looks like we're, it's, we're almost there uh, in terms of being over. Um, but what we've done is we've had to limit the number of residents in clinic per session. Uh, so not all the residents should come. We had to limit the number of patients per resident clinic. So each resident couldn't see as many patients as they could before. Uh, and the uh, patients that they could see initially were limited only to infants. Uh, so that they could get their vaccines. Later on, we increased to the four to six year olds, 11 to 12 year olds, once again, for the vaccines. But now we're seeing many more patients beyond that. And initially, actually, there's a time period where the residents were not coming into clinic. Uh, and then we did telehealth only. And then we did now hybrid telehealth. And so most residents do see patients um, sometimes uh, by telehealth and now more, more in-person visits. We do still use mask, you know, gown sometimes. I think a lot of residents still wear um, uh, uh, special garb, uh, uh, face shield, definitely for the time being. And we're still trying to do individualized charting in the rooms. Um, although I think this past month or this last couple of weeks, we've seen residents come back into the main room, but it's been very difficult for everybody to come together in one room to collaborate. So much of the collaboration had to occur by Zoom and other methods. Um, and so with that in mind, it's just remarkable uh, that we were able to um, uh, proceed with uh, QI projects. And so we'll go ahead with the uh, first of the uh, QI projects by residents. Is everyone able to see that, John? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, excellent. Um, so I am going to start the presentation for the Mount Zion Thursday pod uh, QI project. Uh, Caitlin Royce is also gonna be presenting with me and just wanted to also acknowledge that Ariel White was a huge part of the project but cannot be here um, to present today. Um, so our project was a resident wellness initiative. So just to provide some context for the project, I think we all agree that resident wellness is very important. Wellness is a buzzword, but um, just to dive into the literature a little bit, um, we know that medical trainees are at a very high risk for burnout, um, anxiety, and depression. And um, I think remarkably, rates in some studies of burnout were up to 74%, which um, is alarming. Um, there are also studies showing that physicians are at a higher rate of, or at higher risk of suicide, especially female physicians. Um, but there is now literature that also shows that physician wellness um, is associated with improved mental health and reduced burnout, and actually also improved outcomes for patients. Um, there is also literature on how to do wellness in an effective way. So effective interventions um, in one recent systematic review shared a few things in common. Um, one was that they actually surveyed the participants to guide the intervention design. Um, they also incorporated the intervention into existing didactic curricula. Um, and then they also recruited voluntary participants or made things optional. Um, 
So though um, we are not always doing the best job of wellness, there is hope there are ways to do it well. Um, it's also important to highlight that we decided to take on this project um, in a time of escalated stress. Um, we know that COVID-19 had an effect on everyone, but in particular physicians, I think felt a lot of that. And this one study showed that 63% of physicians um, said that stress levels were severe or near severe, which obviously um, is a huge issue and worth addressing. So for our project, um, our aim statement was um, to increase self-reported resident wellness and improve the continu continuity clinic experience for residents by reserving time for optional resident-driven wellness activities um, that support our own mental health. And I think we felt like this was um, an important and appropriate QI project for the clinic because as we all know, if you're not taking care of yourself, it's impossible to take care of others. And so, um, so this, is, this is what we decided to do. Um, just to dive in to our first PDSA cycle in a little bit more detail, um, I mentioned how we started the planning, but really we kind of utilized human-centered design and um, conducted a focus group to try and elicit um, responses from residents about what they felt would improve their clinic experience most during this kind of unprecedented time of escalated stress. Uh, we found that there was a huge unmet need um, for time to decompress, bond, prioritize wellness, and um, people felt unanimously that that would truly improve their time in continuity clinic um, and in turn their interactions with patients. So we reserved the 1 to 130 slot um, to focus on this optional resident-driven wellness. Um, and, and yeah, so we implemented this curriculum, which was all resident-driven um, and resident-planned. And each activity was, was op optional and, um, and again, focused on wellness. At the end of our first cycle, um, we collected data directly from residents with surveys. The surveys included Likert scales, as well as some open-ended kind of free-form responses to elicit more information. So this is an example um, of some of the data from the Likert scales. Um, this specifically asks um, whether the activities help them to feel more calm and relaxed. And you'll see agree is in blue and neutral is in red. There are no disagrees, which would have been yellow. Um, and to highlight a few in case the text is too small, um, people seem to enjoy yoga with Hannah. Um, holiday crafts, um, and debriefs in general. Um, some of the other questions we asked in the Likert scale, which we didn't include for, for time purposes, were whether it felt it, the activities made people feel more connected to their work, feel more supported, um, and whether they positively impacted their clinic experience and patient encounters. Those, um, those questions all had pretty similar responses to the bar graph I just showed. Um, I also thought it was important to just highlight some of the, the resident responses in our kind of free form um, questions. So um, we asked how the activities changed people's week um, or clinic, and there were a few themes that, that came out. So people um, often said that it provided some sense of community or connectedness, um, helped them to bond with their clinic family. And then also that um, people felt more um, relaxed and that it helped serve as kind of a transition from a busy day um, and that that in turn helped them to be more present for their patients. Cool. Um, we also asked about barriers, um, people arriving late, obviously a barrier, and then some of the activities worked less well on Zoom when we couldn't all be together. Next, we, um, we wanted to figure out how we could balance these wellness activities with the existing primary care education. Um, and people came up with a lot of great ideas, unsurprisingly. Um, people suggested that we could alternate doing wellness and lectures, or that we could shorten the lectures to fit in both. Um, it was also interesting to see that a lot of people felt like the lectures were actually quite stressful um, and compressed in the current time slot and they weren't able to always absorb all the information trying to fit a lot in. Um, and people noted that the wellness activities felt like a better fit in terms of the time. So we, we wanted to do another PDSA cycle. So we also wanted to elicit um, answers about what changes people would like to see. 
So people came up with great ideas, um, including having a calendar or a schedule so they could look forward to the activities because they were so excited about doing them. Um, that we can include more debriefs, which people really enjoyed. Um, and people thought that this should be happening in all the clinic pods. Um, so the last part of the PDSA cycle, the ACT. Um, so we incorporated the changes that people would like to see. Um, we incorporated open-ended debriefing at the start of each wellness activity for about five minutes. Um, and then at the end, we went over a, about a five minute summary of the weekly lecture. And with that included a one page summary that was uploaded um, to a shared drive. Um, we also decided to make a schedule so that people could get excited about what was happening um, in the next week. I'm going to hand it over um, to Caitlin now to talk about our PDSA cycle two. All right, hello. I'm just going to jump right in for the sake of our time. So for our PDSA cycle number two, um, we continued our initiative with the um, with the adaptations that we got from our first cycle. Um, and we really wanted to focus on like how we could continue to improve resident wellness um, and our clinic experience, but without sacrificing the learning from the continuity clinic um, curriculum. Um, and so we, we kind of implemented those changes that we had discussed. Um, and then we did a repeat survey at the end of our second cycle that was modeled after the initial one so we could do a direct comparison. Um, so the data from our second cycle um, is largely very similar to our first, um, just with different um, activities for wellness that were done that you can see down there on the um, horizontal axis. Again, blue is agree, red is neutral, and yellow is disagree, which there are none. So overall, this was very, um, continued to be very favored amongst residents. Um, this just kind of reiterates again these same, the other questions that were elicited in the survey and that the results were very much the same as the previous slide. Um, I won't read through all of these for the sake of time, but I just kind of wanted to highlight some of the common themes that came up when we asked open-ended questions about how this impacted um, residents week or even their day. And you see a lot of um, themes of clearing my mind, decompressing, feeling more centered, feeling more present, allowing for a transition, um, space, joy, connection, creativity, bonding, fun, um, being at ease, allowing them to be fully present for their um, patients in the latter half of the day. And then we asked about the balance of um, trying to incorporate both the wellness activities with the primary care lectures. What we ended up doing was about a, a five minute um, summary of the talk in addition to like a one page document summary that was uploaded to a shared Google Drive that everybody could refer to. And these also seem to be um, well liked that they thought that that five minute summary was enough time for them to kind of focus on it, but they could refer back to the original PowerPoint and also the one page summary that was posted on a Google Drive. As far as barriers, the again, we saw the same things coming up um, in the second cycle as we did the first, that being able to get to clinic on time and being released from AM clinical duties in time to get there were really the one barrier to participating, um, but that even if people were arriving late and weren't able to experience the full wellness activity, um, that it was still valuable. Um, and we also elicited some ideas for future wellness activities. People really liked crafts, um, yoga, gratitude boards, things like that, going for walks. Um, and then the biggest theme we saw in terms of changes for the future was that this continue and that it be a part of um, all clinic pods across our residency. Um, and then again, to not read through all of these, but just to say that, um, whether this optional wellness time would improve, would or did improve residency experience from both cycles, we got resounding yeses, um, which was great to see. Um, and then as far as our next steps, um, we think that this cont continuity clinic um, time, the transition in the day is kind of a natural break and transition point for residents to be able to come together and kind of share this closeness and community. And we already have kind of um, built in community and that it's the same people that you're with every week. So it feels like a really great natural, not forced place to implement um, wellness activities. Um, and that 
we would like to, you know, consider this expanding to other clinic pods. And the other thing that we had thought about is that having a set schedule um, along with the primary care lectures could decrease some of the work and planning that goes into this that probably you know, works um, opposite the direction of the other wellness activities. Um, and these are our references. Thank you all so much for hearing about our project. Um, thank you very much, Cassidy. And Caitlin. And so we'll go through with the uh, rest of the talks. And at the very end, we'll have our uh, question and answer. OK, sounds good. We'll share our slides. Um, Cassidy, can you unshare your slides? We are attempting to do that. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I think I think the host has stopped the sharing. Okay. Oh, can you see my slides now, John? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So uh, I'm Billy, one of the R1s, and then Laura will be my co-presenter. And we're presenting on behalf of the Mount Zion Friday pod. Um, and our project really looks at how to give effective feedback um, through our kind of narrative here. So the first thing we did was we really want to understand um, how to best improve clinic care at Mount Zion. And so we first started with a needs assessment based off of patient surveys. Um, the surveys were short questions. It was basically a text box. Um, we'd ask the patient at the end of their encounter, um, have them scan a QR code and then have them fill out the survey. Um, and this was administered to all patients and their families for all visits, including our newborns. And so here you can see the survey question. Um, all it's tackling is one to two things to improve our clinic experience. Um, and it was pretty open-ended and very general. And again, administered at the end of our like clinic encounter. And so uh, we collected responses and in the next few slides, you'll see uh, excerpts from the survey itself. And so some responses, uh, a lot of them were very positive and very general. Um, in this, you can kind of read it. Uh, one of the patients suggested balloons and candy, um, really good facilities, maybe new facilities if possible. Um, and then in terms of improvements, uh, we saw, again, also very general advice. Um, things were just, I think the biggest takeaway from this slide is um, scheduling appointments for follow-up before the visit starts so that um, any like crying babies and stress can be alleviated before uh, discharge from clinic. Um, the other takeaway we got was a lot of our patients were really enamored with Dr. Farrell, um, evidenced by the first two points, um, and overall had very positive um, experiences in clinic with all our residents. Okay, um, so the second part uh, happened when after readdressing a lot of our response feedbacks. And so we saw that a lot of the responses were general. Um, we didn't get much constructive feedback. And so what we aimed to do then was pivot to a different clinical question. Um, so for this QI project, what we then sought to do was figure out how to best obtain feedback um, from our patients. Like how do you best optimize survey, um, switching more to a method methodological question. And so we did that um, by adding two new methods for data collection. So we had the personal request at the end, and then we added the after visit summary. So we're embedding a, the QR code directly into the ABS, and then having a QR code on the door that just said feedback, um, which was not something that we drew attention to. Of note, the survey question was held uh, exactly the same. So we did not change that survey question at all. Um, and again, in the next few slides, we'll pull kind of excerpts from each of those three modalities. So for the first method, um, the after visit summary, here are some responses that we got. Again, really general um, and kind of directing uh, on how uh, effective the staff and the, the physician team was. Um, the second modality, uh, QR codes responses. Again, these are QR codes that are hung in the room that just say improvement. Um, without physicians directly asking for the feedback. And so um, some of our responses, best place ever. Um, one of the patients asked if ice cream was possible for the uh, clinic rooms. 
And then lastly, the personal request, which was again, the ask at the end of the clinic. Um, other things we've got, toys for kids, again, very positive experience um, for, for the patients. And so now I'll transition to Laura to really talk about our results and discussion. Okay, so um, here is kind of a pie chart of our data. This is after adding the new survey, survey types here. So um, we got 57% of the responses via in-person requests for feedback. Uh, we got 29% via the poster QR code, and then we got 14% from the ABS. Next slide. So ultimately, requests made by providers led to the largest number of responses, and that was true um, once the ABS and posters were introduced, that people were most likely to respond to those in-person feedback requests. Next slide. So uh, next slide, Billy, if you could. There we go. Um, so ultimately, our in-person requests ended up being the most effective survey response tool. Um, it was harder probably for patients to say no to those in-person requests. And it also draws attention to the importance of the survey to the clinic as well. Um, with a lower response to the ABS, uh, we wondered how much families were looking through their paperwork in its entirety. Um, and that was just a question that popped up after looking at our data. And then finally, while we appreciated the very good feedback that we got across the board, um, this very general prompt may not have encouraged the more specific responses that we were looking for. You can go to the next slide. In terms of limitations, uh, there were a number of them for this study. Providers themselves did not remember to ask at every clinic visit um, to, for ha to have patients' families fill out these um, surveys. They may have forgotten to put up the posters in the clinic rooms um, on the day of clinic, or that they um, forgot to put the QR code in the ABS. So we really do not have any denominators to tell us what the rates were of each type of response. Secondly, there was certainly individual variation among providers and how they may have asked for feedback, um, which is one of a number of other uncontrolled variables in our study. And finally, our N in total, including those from before and after we changed methods was 20. Again, we don't have a de denominator for that N, but it does suggest a quite low response rate in general. And it also means we really can't draw many conclusions from our data given the low power. But in conclusion, um, each method did in fact produce responses and um, in-person provider requests were the most effective in producing responses. And um, perhaps going forward, a more specific questionnaire may elicit more constructive responses than the ones that we got. Finally, we just wanted to thank our wonderful Friday Pod co-residents, our fearless attendings, um, Dr. Rosales, uh, Dr. Laguna and Dr. Burnett and our wonderful patients and their families. Thank you so much, um, uh, Billy and Laura. And so we'll go ahead and segue, I think, to the, uh, the residents from China Basin. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, today I'll be telling you about a quality improvement project that I conducted with Sonia Swenson at uh, our primary care clinic, um, China Basin. And this project was related to improving childhood immunization rates. So it's uh, been shown that childhood immunization rates, particularly during COVID have been declining um, and this was also true at our clinic at China Basin. And so because of this, the primary care leadership um, asked our clinic to focus on improving the rates of childhood immunizations um, for this year. 
And specifically, Combo 10 is a performance metric that's used nationwide to assess childhood immunization rates. And it's the measure that we focused on um, in our study. And more specifically, Combo 10 is defined, it's a percentage, um, and it's defined as the percentage of children uh, two years old who, by their second birthday, have had these 10 vaccines listed here, including two influenza vaccines. Um, in the numerator, we have all of the children um, who received all their vaccines before they turned two. And as a denominator, we have all of the children ages two to three um, in our clinic. And what I'm showing here is a graph of the combo 10 rates um, calculated each month during most of the year uh, 2020. And what we can see in blue is that the rates of combo 10 immunizations have actually decreased throughout this year. And because of that, um, the clinic set a target um, shown here in green um, for us to reach uh, by the end of this year. And also to, to address this, this problem of declining immunization rates, um, we started by creating a fishbone diagram in collaboration with the medical assistants, staff, and physicians at China Basin. So the fishbone is divided into five parts um, shown here in blue. And in particular, we decided to focus on um, administrative factors such as the um, lack of uh, rescheduling or canceled well child appointments. Um, and in addition, also the patient-specific factors such as anti-vaccine sentiments or COVID-related concerns. So I'll now pass it over to Sonia to continue with uh, talking about some of these interventions. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so from the fishbone, our practice identified possible interventions and categorized them based on expected effort and yield. So in the high yield, high effort category, we had outreach calls to patients who were behind on their combo 10 immunizations, as well as manual panel cleanup. In the high yield and lower effort category, we had ensuring that every patient coming in for a well child visit had their next well child visit scheduled by the end of the day. And in a quick cross section, looking at 30 uh, infants in October of 2020, we saw that about 70% of infants had their next visit scheduled by the same day. And in the low effort but low or uncertain yield category, we had removing video visit only blocks in the schedule to improve access to face-to-face -face appointments and also ensuring that all outside immunizations were put into the electronic medical record. Our clinic decided to focus on the three high yield interventions in green. While those interventions were underway at the China Basin Clinic, um, generally, Daniel and I conducted phone interviews with families of patients aged 15 to 24 months who were behind on combo 10 to better understand barriers to immunization completion. Uh, interviews were conducted in English and Spanish, and we sent MyChart surveys if families could not be reached by phone and had an active MyChart. The stated purpose of our study was QI, not patient care, although when relevant, we relayed our findings to the outreach team. And we had four questions, two multiple choice and two open-ended. We confirmed the medical home of the child and made sure it was China Basin still. We reviews, reviewed the immunization status, and then we asked families to identify barriers to completing immunization, and we asked for their suggestions for the clinic to help facilitate on-time immunization. In over the course of five months, we called 15 families and got nine responses. We sent three MyChart messages of which we got zero responses. Six families were concerned about acquiring COVID-19 in clinic or while taking public transportation to clinic. Four of the families moved out of state or changed providers. One family changed insurance plan um, and were unsure if they could still come to UCSF. Um, and two families had had recent well child visits at China Basin and were unaware that they'd been due for a second flu shot at that visit. And one family didn't want to get the flu shot due to perceived low efficacy of the flu shot. So overall, um, these, the incomplete vaccination records at China Basin largely reflect a hesitancy to bring kids into clinic due to COVID-19 and transfer of care. Most families were willing to bring their kids in for immunization now that the pandemic was subsiding and it was a minority of patients who expressed vaccine hesitancy. Suggestions from families included phone call reminders about upcoming appointments, 
phone calls to reschedule missed appointments and increased availability of nurse visits. In parallel to our phone surveys, the clinical staff at China Basin conducted, continued to conduct the outreach calls and manual panel cleanup. And you can see a clear uptick in the blue line um, of combo 10 completion after these efforts were started. In November of 2020, we were at 63%, and by December of 2020, we were at nearly 75%. And our rate has held steady around 74% since then. So in conclusion, uh, we learned that reasons for incomplete immunization are multifactorial. Our interviews with families touched on all aspects of the fishbone. We learned that phone call outreach is acceptable to families and desired by some, and phone calls were more effective than MyChart messaging. And given the reasons for delayed immunization completion, panel cleanup and outreach calls were highly effective at boosting the combo 10 rate. Our next steps will include continuing to track performance monthly and meeting quarterly to re-strategize next interventions. We didn't make any changes at our last quarterly meeting because our combo 10 rate was holding steady. And finally, we'd like to extend our gratitude to the entire China Basin Clinic team. And thank you very much. Daniel and Sonia, thank you very much. All righty, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. I'm Anya. Um, I'm one of the interns uh, who is at China Basin for uh, primary care clinic. Uh, the other residents who were on this study with me were Matt Decker and Claire Johns, who both could not be here today. And our preceptor is the wonderful and very popular John Wong. Uh, so we wanted to take a look at timely hemoglobin, hemoglobin screening. Um, and I'll go over a little bit more about what that even is and why we do it. So here we go. So the AAP recommends uh, that all kids are screened between nine and 12 months um, for anemia. They recommend that we get a hemoglobin and that's also the time that we get the lead. Um, and then they recommend that we do an additional screening uh, for at-risk patients, again, somewhere between one and five years of age. Um, we do this because we want to detect patients who might have um, nutritional iron deficiency and also to detect patients uh, with hemoglobinopathies. And of course, a lot of that um, we do find on the newborn screen, but for hemoglobinopathies that are not identified there or for patients who, for whatever reason, didn't get the newborn screen, this is another um, touch point where we can do that. Uh, just to remind ourselves, I think we all um, know of these risk factors for iron deficiency anemia, um, but prematurity, low birth weight, um, babies who are taking formula that is not iron fortified, which is pretty uncommon these days, um, both introducing cow's milk before one year of age and then babies who take over 24 ounces of cow's milk per day, those with restricted diets or health problems, which is vague, but um, you can think of um, chronic inflammation or malabsorption, um, those with increased levels of lead, again, we also check a lead level, and then those who exclusively breastfeed without supplementing. Um, this is something that we're not going to go over. I just wanted to remind all of us that we uh, at one point did know all about hepcidin and all of the ways that iron is absorbed and transferred in the body. So our aim was to improve the rate of routine hemoglobin screening um, in nine to 13 month olds by 10% by July, 2021. Um, our study group was 13 month olds who received their primary care at China Basin. Uh, we looked at our baseline screening rate. So how many um, kids were we catching and screening appropriately between nine and 13 months? Um, it was around 79%, and we wanted to increase that to 89%. So we generated a list of 13 month olds each month. So we were never repeating the same kids. Um, and we looked at in, into those charts and we said, um, did they get a hemoglobin screen? If so, was it serum or point of care? And then for those who missed it, why? And this is what we found. So there were two main reasons that um, the hemoglobin was not screened in this population. First, that their 12 month well child check was missed. And second, that the order for hemoglobin um, was placed but never completed. 
So um, in terms of intervening, for the first problem of missing the 12 month well child check, we worked with staff at China Basin um, to make sure that follow ups were scheduled in conjunction with the preceding well child check. And this was something that was already part of the workflow of China Basin. Um, as of the, the onset of the pandemic, we were beginning to schedule patients for the next visit at the end of the previous visit. Um, and then in order to address the serum orders that were never actually completed, uh, we talked to the providers um, to try and figure out what might work better. And we concluded and they concluded that uh, really the point of care was the best way to actually get that test done. So we continued on with our monthly chart reviews. And uh, even though our rates did improve a little bit after we made those initial interventions, um, we found that we were still running into the same two problems. One, that the, you know, the, the 12 month visit did not happen. And two, that the hemoglobin orders were still sometimes being ordered as serum and those were not completed. So in order to address the first problem, the next change we made was to um, make sure that the the patient was scheduled for a 12 month check um, during the tele rooming process for the nine month video visits, because we found that um, we could, you know, nine month visits were not video for all, but were for some. And for those, they weren't getting the same scheduling at the end of the in-person visit. Um, for the serum hemoglobin, um, it turns out that for our smart set for the 12 month well child check, um, the smart set defaults to a serum order. And so we walked through with providers the way to actually change and customize their smart set so that it defaulted to point of care instead. And this is what we found. Um, so we started out over here in November at around 79%. Um, the green arrow is where we made those interventions that I just talked about. So the tele um, scheduling for the nine month video well child check and then the switching the smart set to the point of care. Um, in March of 2021, we felt really good about ourselves. Um, and even though it dropped off a little bit after that, it shows a general upward trend still. So some improvement in our screening rates. Um, our lessons learned as we just went over the most common reasons, and really those were the two that predominated. I don't think there were really any other reasons that, um, that came up or seemed relevant, um, were that the hemoglobin screen was not done because the well child check did not happen, um, or that they ordered serums and the serums did not um, get actually drawn. And so, we found that in scheduling visits in a different way that accommodated the video visits that we were now doing because of COVID and in switching to smart sets to obtain samples in a more convenient way did help improve screening rates. And I just wanna end with a couple of final thoughts um, that don't directly relate to this study, but are sort of for, um, you know, in the bigger picture, what are we doing and why are we doing it? and how best should we do this. So in terms of thinking about iron screening in general, um, it's great because it can identify at-risk patients. Um, the, some of the downsides or cons, um, it can miss patients who are iron deficient, but not yet anemic. And it can also miss patients who were formula fed for the first year and so we're not anemic at that time or iron deficient, but um, we're sort of at risk to become iron deficient once they transition to solid foods. Uh, so things to think about are possibly comparing um, screening results for formula fed, ver fed versus breastfed infants, and then also um, considering a later screen around 15 to 18 months that might catch some of those pa patients that wouldn't be caught in the initial first uh, their first nine to 12 months of life. Um, and uh, I will end it with that. Those are my references. Thank you, everyone at China Basin. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Anya. And I think now we'll have our um, uh, last presentation from a large group. All righty. Hi, my name is Tina. I'm excited to be starting the presentation for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday pods at Mount Zion. 
um, we all decided to address um, this particular issue of food insecurity screening. And as a brief outline, I'll go over the background. Each pod will give some data and lessons learned, and then um, we will go over our final takeaways. So the San Francisco Board of Supervisors um, dictates, and it is widely held that food is a basic human right and is essential for human health. Um, food security and insecurity has specific definitions that you can see here. Specifically, food insecurity is defined as limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally safe foods or limited or uncertain ability to acquire foods. Um, especially in COVID, there has been a significant increase in food secure insecurity with a disproportionate impact on families of color. And specifically in San Francisco, um, it is a big problem. This was actually a study done in 2018, which showed that one in four San Francisco residents are at risk of food insecurity because of a disproportionate income to cost of living ratio. Um, and in a study of WIC families, 60% had reported food insecurity. Um, so with this in mind, all three pods had our shared project goal of increasing food insecurity screening. Um, and we all used a short uh, validated two question screener that is endorsed by the AAP, which has a 97% sensitivity rate. Um, and these two questions consist of within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more, yes or no. And within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more, yes or no. So with that, I'll move on to the data and process for my pod, uh, Monday pod, um, and our um, experience with screening. So in addition to the, the two questions that um, was listed, we also came up with our own resource list to give to families that did screen positive. You can see here, um, it's a, a group of local and government um, programs. So our screening process had two phases. Um, phase one in, involved using the two question screener dot phrase at every visit um, inserted in our templates. And we had a surprisingly high screen rate uh, of 72%. So of the patients seen, 138 patients seen, 100 patients were screened. And just as surprisingly, we had a positive screen rate of 17%. Um, this was between November to December of 2020. Um, in our phase two, we um, tried to increase our screen rate by implementing uh, something called the QI timeout. So at the start of every clinic, we had uh, a quick 30 second check-in for members to insert the dot phrase into templates as well as to discuss anything that had come up recently. Um, and we were able to increase our screen rate by 3%. Um, and then the positive screen rate remained about the same, uh, 15%. So I think our process really showed us two important things. One is that we are able to successfully screen patients with a two question screener. And two, um, we were able to capture a um, significant number of patients who did have food insecurity. And I think there's a rich opportunity for further data analysis um, to further improve screening. So looking at demographic breakdown of the patients that did screen positive, um, potentially considering region specific resources if one region um, was more affected than another looking at the screening variation between clinic members and pods. And then this interesting concept of actually um, improving no-show rates if we are able to offer screening and follow-up resources. And that's, uh, those are things that we would love to explore down the road. Um, now I'll pass it on to Lindsay to talk about the other parts of our project. Thanks, Tina. Um... So our project uh, definitely spurred um, some several future opportunities for our clinic pod. So Dr. Shannon Chan applied for uh, a UCSF patient care grant and was awarded $1,500 to provide non-perishable food packages for families that screen positive. Um, and so I think future plans are to ensure sustainability of this project. 
Uh, next, uh, Dr. Priya Pathak made a uh, connection to the Mount Zion Food Pharmacy, which is run by Dr. Gina Moreno-John through UCSF Department of Internal Medicine. Um, they have several community par partners to provide healthy foods for families. Um, and I think next steps are uh, working with them to ensure a stable uh, supply chain and um, uh, connecting our pediatric families at Mount Zion. So lastly, um, again, future directions, including continuing to establish the same sustainability of these resources, assessing other social determinants of health, expanding our resource guide, incorporating an EPIC referral system for these, for these needs that are identified, and then including these screening questions in our note templates um, to provide a um, standard for our, our physicians. All right, thank you so much. All right, hi everyone, my name is Lauren. I'm one of the third year residents. I'm gonna be presenting today um, for our Mount Zion Tuesday pod. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as Tina had mentioned, so we ended up as a Tuesday pod had joined Monday and Wednesday pods project with the food screening, um, really in the 2021 cycle component. So we decided in 2020 December that we are going to join the food screening project um, with a two question validated questionnaire. So we rolled this out in January of 2021 with using the apex dot phrase, um, which we are trying to, our goal ultimately was to screen 30% of the patients that we saw in clinic. Um, February, we had our first follow-up meeting after the launch, um, and then in March, April, we what we found might be more helpful was to incorporate the dot phrase into our note templates. So several of the residents in clinic included it into their note templates. Um, additionally, in April, um, one of our residents in our clinic, uh, Dr. Schneider, created a food insecurity QI Google project survey, which was another way for us to document how our screening was going. Um, and then our last uh, QI meeting have been June, the first week of June of this year. Next slide, please. So um, similar to Monday Pod, um, we use a dot phrase that had already been created by the social determinants of health team at Mission Bay. It was a dot COVID food um, SF that included local food um, resources. Additionally, um, I, in addition to the food resource dot phrase that we can include in our ABS, we had Kristen, who is our amazing social worker, actually meet, um, she did meet actually with all of our patients that did screen positive on our um, food insecurity screen. Next slide, please. So this is our project evaluation and impact. So our goal, so we um, screened from January until the first week of June. So this reflects um, just the data from 2021. Um, our goal was to screen about 30% of our patients. Um, we didn't quite meet our goal overall, which we'll review in the next slide. Um, but as you can see, so the gray bar shows the percent of patients screened, the yellow bars show the number of patients screened in clinic, and then the blue bars show the number of patients seen in clinic. So overall, our percent over the last um, months from January to June continued to improve on our screening rates, um, but we still need to meet our goal, the 30%. Uh, next slide. So um, overall, we screened about 22% uh, of patients. Of those patients, 4% screened positive. And of those 4% patients, all patients um, met with social work and then additionally were provided with some other list of food resources within their um, local area. We do see patients outside the San Francisco area. So we worked with Kristen, our social worker, um, to give resources if patients were located out of San Francisco. Next slide, please. So next steps and lessons learned. Um, so I think one thing we really learned is how we can streamline this and make it um, more efficient, especially for our first line providers to make sure that they remember to screen. So incorporating our apex dot phrase into the resident clinic notes. Um, I really love that Monday pod did their QI timeouts because we did see that when we would have our QI meetings that our screening rates would go up. So I think having a QI timeout at the beginning of each pod session is a great idea. And then just ongoing collaboration with other clinics, community organizations and patients. Um, and then again, so amazing that Dr. Chan wrote this grant to do the UCSF patient care fund, but expanding in clinic research resources that we can give patients while they're actually in clinic. Um, additional next steps, um, as I mentioned, improving provider epic workflow, uh, creating more structured resources for families, and, and then establishing a clear follow-up plan for patients who screen positive. Um, as often that they would screen positive when we give them the resource list and they would be out on their way, but figuring out a system where we can have clear follow-up in place to make sure that they continue to get the resources they need. Um, next slide, please. 
So thank you. Um, this is part of our Tuesday pod. We want to thank our amazing uh, social worker, Kristen, and then our mentors and preceptors, Dr. Takayama, Dr. Uba, and Dr. Agueza. All right, thank you. And I will switch it over to Wednesday pod. All right, I'm gonna get us started with Wednesday pod. Here are pictures of everyone in our clinic and a big shout out to our preceptors, Dr. Albin, Dr. Roth, and Dr. Park. Next slide. So we met um, initially as a group deciding that we were gonna focus in on the food insecurity similar with the other pods that we're hearing from. We set a clinic goal of trying to meet a 50% screening rate for all well child checks, acknowledging that follow-ups um, Early discharge visits for new babies discharged from the hospital may not be the best place. Um, so honing in on our well child checks. It was really important for us as a group to make sure that we had a plan for when positive screams came up. Um, so we, similar to other pods, um, put together a dot phrase, the dot food res Wednesday pod, um, acknowledging that there were a lot of different resources being distributed at the time um, for COVID and wanted to make sure that the resources that we did give our families were up to date and also available in Spanish. Next slide. Next slide. Um, for our timeline, we also had our first meeting in December. We decided at that time to look back at how we were doing without this intervention, um, collected clinic data from October and November, which we called our pre-PSA cycle one. Um, next slide. And found unsurprisingly, at least documented in the notes, we were doing um, a pretty poor job with a lot of room for growth in terms of asking our families how they were doing, especially knowing that COVID was hitting our families hard, that this was really an opportunity for us um, to play a bigger, more impactful role. So a 2% um, had a lot of room to grow and had that target of 50 that you see across the slide there. Next slide. For our first PDSA cycle, similar to um, the other pods, we had focused on this two question screener. Um, we left it up to residents um, with the idea being that they would use the um, pre-charting period to formally put it into their clinic notes for the day using our dot phrase, but was not uh, incorporated into the broader screener. Um, and then next slide checked in to see how we were doing um, after the period January through mid-March, um, finding really closely at our goal 40%, 47% of all visits um, and just above our target for all of our well-child visits. Um, when we posed the question to the group, how are things going, that S part, the study of the PDSA cycles, we were finding that um, Residents were reporting often remembered for the first visit. We may remind people before clinic, remember to do our, our screeners, so you remember for the first patient, but then having a lot of difficulty remembering for the second, third, fourth, fifth patients um, on any given day. Residents also reported they were really only remembering it prompt um, in their clinic note. So that key step in having to remember to put in the dot phrase into your clinic template greatly facilitated uh, remembering to screen and then if you did not remember oftentimes um, it was not done and third as part of our discussion here to see how things were going the issue of privacy came up um, which was twofold we had um, a nice discussion about how families who were screening positive were um, that the documentation was going, um, if there was a, a set way that people were putting it into their notes or felt like it was really a private issue and how to um, properly document that came up. The other issue of privacy that we were coming up against um, was the awkwardness that can come um, when there's an older child in the room, whether or not to address the parents um, there or if that was an uncomfortable question to ask out loud. So next slide, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Munya. Hi everyone, I know we're running short on time, so I'll try to make this quick and then if there are any follow-up questions, we can be reached through email. Um, so Tina, would you be able to go to the next slide, please? I wanted to talk about our um, intervention, which was a paper screener, which we have found can be really helpful, particularly when addressing more sensitive topics. Um, and so we created these screeners that um, we had in the workroom for residents to hand out to the families to fill out. Um, next slide, please, Tina. Um, for our next PDSA cycle, it was March through May. Next slide, Tina. Um, and what we found was interesting. Overall, the screening percentages were the same, but the paper screener use was mixed. Some people had marked improvement in their screening, going from like 
40% to 80%. And then some people had actually worked in the opposite direction. Um, we did come across some challenges with the paper screener. There were questions about some literacy um, issues with families. And then because we weren't using the central workroom because of COVID, it was hard to just remember. Um, Tina, next slide, please. Um, so our big takeaways is that when planning a uniform clinic intervention, you have to consider individual practice differences. Um, and then I think similar to what the other groups found is it's easier to ask when smart phrases are incorporated into the templates. And then for all social screeners, we have to be really thoughtful about how we document, about how we even ask. Um, and then I uh, just want to also acknowledge that we didn't have patient or family input into this project um, at this point. Um, next slide, Tina. Um, special thank you to our lovely Wednesday pod. Um, we love you guys. Next slide. And then just big takeaways from all three of these projects is just that social screening is really important um, because not only when we don't ask, we're going to miss a lot of needs, but I think it's uh, an uh, important way to also build patient rapport and to improve no-show rates. Um, and then another big takeaway is with everything in clinic, when you have so much to ask, um, a streamlined process can be really important to improve screening rates. And then there are so many opportunities to also collaborate within the larger UCSF community. Um, that is all. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank you much. Very I think we've gone over a little bit, but I uh, just want to thank everybody. It's just an amazing presentation. And I think Dr. Hurst, do we have to stop here, right? Well, uh, sorry. Uh, well, uh, yes, we are we are at the end of our time. So I think, uh, but this has been fantastic. I want to thank all the all of our outstanding residents for their great uh, work that they presented, and also to John Takayama for being such a fabulous mentor to our residents and to overseeing this process. Uh, Sandrine, anything you'd like to add? No, just congratulations all for these fantastic projects and incredibly impressive, especially since it was a challenging year. Yes, thanks everybody for participating. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>